So the Quaker business method is discussed in uh, Quaker Faith and Practice, which is the Book of Discipline. I'll just quickly run through, at a very high level, what the business method is about. The term clerk uh, you can think of as rather like the committee chair uh, in secular terms, but the, the clerk has a very special role. A uh, clerk runs a meeting by taking an, an agenda of items. Uh, each one of these items gets considered in turn. The clerk usually presents the item, uh, a brief summary of the item, uh, opens up a, I'll call it discussion for the time being, although it isn't really a discussion in the sense that we would normally think of a discussion, for friends in the meeting to give their views. And there are particular ways in which that's uh, structured. Then the clerk writes a minute summarising the discerned position of the meeting for the record, whilst everybody else in the meeting, and this I think is perhaps one of the most surprising things, sits in silence. The clerk reads the draft minute back uh, to the meeting and the people can then make comments about the minute uh, which changes its minor details rather than the overall content of the minute. So this is my understanding of, in theory, how it should work. But there's lots of details which we would need to unpack for all of these points. My account of the business method is drawn both from Quaker Book of Discipline, Faith and Practice, but also on my observations uh, of um, many different Quaker uh, business meetings, some of them conforming to the ideal and some of them uh, very far from the ideal. Faith and Practice um, sections two and three basically are the sections which address how a meeting for business should be run. Bullet points, summaries uh, of them are on the uh, left. Okay. You can find this actually um, online if you just go to the main uh, Quaker website. One of the claims is that it's been tested for 300 years and develop, developed and incrementally tested. Okay. And so as a scientist, that immediately uh, got me interested because, well, maybe through a process of some kind of evolutionary selection, those aspects of it that worked well were kept and those aspects which uh, were less functional were dropped. And so maybe there's a good reason why the uh, business method works. And there are ideas such as you shouldn't be lobbying and using rhetoric in order to get your argument across uh, when you're invited by the clerk to talk. Especially you shouldn't be jumping up and uh, making uh, strong rebuttals immediately. So there should be a silence between each contribution uh, when someone's making a point. Okay? And this length of silence really depends on what the clerk decides as a, uh, is appropriate. We're asked in, as an expectation uh, of running the method to consider each point that anybody makes and reflect on it. So you shouldn't be thinking about, okay, what am I going to do to rebut uh, the last thing that was said uh, or to argue against uh, uh, the point in general, but to actually uh, listen and think about the points that are being made. And this is the role of the silence here. Uh, we're also asked to balance fear of novelty with um, well-considered option. Uh, if something's novel, we might have a, a gut reaction against it, but we're asked to try and keep in check those kinds of reactions. Uh, section 2.9 also talks about the importance of listening, not persuading, um, and not reiterating points which have previously been uh, made. And so this is something which typically happens in many meetings. Uh, just like the meeting I was chairing yesterday, uh, there were particular people who wanted to restate their points many times, uh, rather like a battering ram, uh, to try and persuade everybody else. There's this process of discernment. The clerk is meant to be taking and listening to all of the views that are presented and quietly then coming to some sense of what, is it, what it is that... Uh, most people uh, are uh, thinking uh, in the meeting, getting a sense of the meeting. But this isn't getting compromise or consensus. It's something different, and this is really very clear, uh, both in practice and also uh, as stated in uh, faith and practice. Um, and it's really impo uh, important uh, so that you don't get everybody just aggregating around uh, uh, some mishmash of all of the views that are presented. And the way that this is expressed is uh, the meeting is meant to settle and unite uh, on a particular view. 
and the clerk sort of then summarizes that uh, in, in the minute. So there's some process going on here, which, at least in my experience, uh, uh, often, not always, but often works. So seeking unity, again, is emphasized uh, in section uh, uh, 3.6. And so uh, these sections, uh, three po uh, 2 and 3 in faith and uh, practice, uh, deal either with the role of the clerk in the meeting or as instructions to uh, the whole of the uh, individuals in the meeting about how the meeting should run. So that's the difference between these two sections. And so everybody's also asked to think about when the sense of the meeting is reached. Contrary views should have been aired and heard. Uh, this is not meant to be a process of getting consensus or compromise. There's no voting because voting uh, really would differentiate um, and set apart some, uh, some against the other. So recognizing a minority views uh, and acknowledging minority views in, in a group is really important. Just to work the method and trust that it works um, and don't expect there to be sudden um, agreements and that it may well be the right decision of a meeting is to delay making a decision and leave it to another time. So it's really a very difficult task for the clerk to decide uh, whether or not that's the case, uh, case or not. We're also uh, asked not to block uh, the, uh, a minute uh, which uh, uh, we feel strongly against if the rest of the group um, think that uh, it's the right course of action. And this you will immediately think, but this then contradicts the idea of uh, compromise um, and um, uh, coming to consensus. Okay. And maybe there is a, a difference. Okay. And I think this is a particularly hard uh, aspect to uh, uh, try and square the circle of. So finding new s solutions that supersede um, our initially valid views, initially held views, is very much what uh, this process is meant to be about. Trying to get innovation, trying to get some creativity uh, in uh, the decision-making process. So the, what the clerk does is, after... Uh, views have been invited uh, uh, and people have spoken, the clerk then tries to summarise, uh, or more than summarise, come to some statement about what, what it is that the, the whole meeting thinks uh, that unites the meeting. Okay? And this act of uniting authorises the clerk uh, then to draft the minute. If the minute is uh, uh, then uh, accepted, then that's then what authorises the decision that's then taken. So it's very much a collective, um, a collective uh, uh, activity. Minutes are not prepared retrospectively. It's not the case that you write the minutes afterwards and then at the next meeting you ask the people who are there, is this what was agreed or not at the last meeting? Okay. Of course, you then have to wait for the clerk to write the minute. And this is quite a challenge for, for somebody right there and then to take all of the views in some way synthesize them and then summarize them in such a way that people will unite behind it or set aside their differences. My approach to thinking about the uh, business method is to actually uh, do what scientists do, which is to decompose things and then look at their component parts. I've identified 29 different uh, specific components and then organize them into um, nine different aspects. Here there's four of them and uh, there's then two classes of these aspects. So there's a role of si a silence. And the meeting should begin and end with a period of silence, a few minutes. Um, there should be silent pauses between contributions and at the clerk's discretion, these may be uh, made much longer. And I've certainly been in meetings where things have started to get heated and the clerk says, uh, have, has said, no, we need uh, some silence. And uh, there may even be uh, a sitting in silence for three, four or five minutes, depending on what the clerk thinks. And I know that some people who have been in meetings and been watching your clock as the time ticks by, they think this is an incredible waste of time. We could really be thrashing and arguing about the points uh, that we want, uh, want to try and resolve. So... A key thing about the uh, clerk's role, uh, which is emphasized, is that the clerk is a servant of the meeting. They aren't like the chair. They aren't the leader of the meeting, although they do have a role of authority, which they have to exercise. So there's a bit of a contradiction there as well. Right. Um, 
uh, it's usually Quakers who have been uh, in Quakerism a long time who get into the role of clerk because there's a lot of uh, tacit knowledge that's required in order to be able to do it well. And I've seen it being done uh, in, in a way which is really marvellous. And it, there's issues to uh, do with maybe it's too much dependent on the skill of the individual rather than the method itself. Um, and I've seen it being done really poorly by people who are in, uh, inexperienced. Uh, the clerk prepares the um, uh, agenda, okay? uh, perhaps based on previous um, uh, decisions that have been made. And the principal role of the clerk is to discern what the sense of the meeting is and to write the draft uh, minutes, uh, but also to run the meeting efficiently. I have been in Quaker meetings that um, uh, have me meant to uh, run until 2 o'clock and we've been sat there until 3.30. Okay. Really not acceptable for, uh, certainly uh, for business people. Okay. And so, but often that's because perhaps the clerk hasn't ex exerted the right degree of authority. So, and I've seen it uh, work marvellously where uh, there's five or ten minutes left and we th there's still half the agenda items there. But because the clerk is, uh, has arranged the agenda in such a way, uh, we finish up in time in a way that doesn't seem hurried. So that level of experience is really very important. Writing the minutes uh, contemporaneously uh, is um, another critical aspect. And there are types of minutes uh, which perhaps can help decide, um, help us decide w what kind of actions we should be taking in terms of um, the decisions that are to be made. So records, uh, minutes of record which record things that, which have happened. Uh, of exercise which are when there's been a discussion and the discussion is to be summarized but without necessarily uh, making a decision and then also minutes uh, of decision okay. uh, and I, th I don't know that all meetings use uh, uh, this tripartite dis uh, distinction but I've certainly seen it at, at, at play in many so discernment and unity uh, finding the sense of the meeting uh, it's not meant to be compromise and consensus um, and uh, trying to make sure the clerk understands what's going on in the minds of the individuals is really important. So uh, saying hope so is how do you tell, tell a Quaker because uh, in a meeting they will say hope so rather than I agree. Yeah. Also there's a phrase that friend speaks my mind uh, which is also another classic uh, uh, term which is used amongst Quakers but it's also abused because really if you think about the method it should only be used uh, not as a matter of saying, like, I vote for this point which is being made and I support this point that's being made, because we're meant to sit in silence and reflect on it. Uh, the use of that is really only if you're moved to say, because, uh, say that you support someone else's view, because they've just made exactly the point that you wanted to make. Okay. But it's not, to, uh, uh, not meant to be a backdoor voting mechanism. How do we distinguish uh, between compromise and consensus and the process of uh, uniting and discernment? And so I've thought long and hard about this, and this is one way which uh, I'm trying to, uh, which I try to characterise it. So consensus, um, you can think of as a process where each person comes to the meeting where there are uh, their particular favoured position, say the person who's uh, uh, blue, and this is the sphere. Uh, sort of the light brown circle of, of what they would accept uh, if it came to a compromise. Uh, the dotted line uh, also is repeated around these other people to indicate what they're coming to the meeting with as, okay, this is my bottom line of what I'll accept or not accept. And so as each person makes their contribution, let's say the green person uh, makes their contribution and argues for it, this is what uh, uh, they would accept. And so the potential space of solution morphs. And then the next person um, makes their argument and you try and incorporate in terms of that what they would accept. And finally, somebody else. And so you get some unholy mixture of uh, ideas as the decision that's been made. And I think that um, when you read the minutes of many meetings, you recognise a process somewhat like this going on. The way I understand what's going on in Quaker uh, meetings, you know what you would agree to outright as you come to a meeting. And so there are injunctions for us to think carefully about the issues and be prepared um, and be open-minded before we come to a meeting. And I didn't emphasize that enough. Uh, and so each person has 
uh, a core of what, of what uh, uh, they might w uh, wish to happen, but also what they might uh, be uh, uh, willing to unite around, plus then what they would really disagree with. And a core part of the process here is to actually sit and listen and to hear other views and to allow your uh, views to be uh, transformed. Okay. So you're not arguing at a particular point which, you, uh, which you've come to the meeting with. If you look from a bird's eye view, uh, what might be happening is uh, each person comes with uh, these different positions and ideas. Over the course of the meeting, then they may shift their positions. And if there is some truth out there to be uh, found, then they will move perhaps a bit closer to it. And the black dot represents what the clerk is doing, listening to all that's being said. Although I've shown it uh, item by item, uh, you should imagine all of this happening at the same time. The clerk then tries to, to find, uh, find something which unites all of those views. Some of you who are skeptical say, well, yeah, this is compromise again. But perhaps it's a different kind of compromise which uses different kinds of processes to get to the final uh, result. The second group of uh, tools was, but to do with culture and values, and this shows in shape the, then uh, the process and how things work. Even the way that meetings are configured facilitate uh, the ideas that um, uh, you should be open to new, I uh, new ideas and also that each person's contribution uh, is uh, equally valued. And so a typical way in which a uh, meeting for business is organised, uh, the clerk uh, and perhaps uh, somebody supporting them, a co-clerk, would sit at a table where they would write the minutes and people would sit in an uh, arc around them so that the clerk can see everybody, uh, everybody and what their responses are. It gives a degree of uh, equality rather than, say, a cabinet table where you have a, uh, a chair and then some people are closer uh, to the uh, chair than the others. Part of what's expected is that you'd stand and speak clearly. And this is very unusual in a, a meeting, a, a typical committee meeting. Um, and the last time I saw somebody stand at a committee meeting was when they got so heated they were just about to uh, run out and uh, had to be persuaded to stay. The clerk sometimes has their own personal views and they're not supposed to be bringing their own personal uh, uh, views to the table and then uh, using the position of the clerk to uh, uh, influence the, the, uh, the unity of the meeting. And so there's a deliberate uh, action that they're meant to take, which is to step aside. They should step away from the table to symbolically say, this is now not my role of discerning, but my own personal view. There's all sorts of cultural expectations um, in terms of attending regularly uh, meetings for business because then you know what the previous decisions were and the discussions that have uh, gone on, so you, uh, you, uh, they don't have to be all uh, re-rehearsed. Um, you should only speak once uh, unless the clerk calls you um, again. So uh, jumping in isn't something that's done, and I've certainly been in meetings where there are people who've been really itching to uh, say things over and over again, and the clerk is basically... Uh, uh, refuse to call them. Onus on all of us to be personally responsible and being prepared. So if there are documents which have been prepared ahead of time and there's been effort and care to do, uh, do that, then you should read them and think about them before coming along. So there's a discipline that's required. Okay? Uh, the hope is that maybe because people have done the work beforehand, then excessive amounts of time aren't spent with the clerk having to go into the minutiae of the arguments which are presented. We can just do a quick summary just to remind people. And there's the discipline regarding the unity of the meetings. Um, uh, approach is to try and get unity in the meeting so that you can make decisions. Open-mindedness is another one of the values. So hearts and mind prepared is a phrase that uh, Quakers uh, will all be familiar with. Uh, but also the idea of entertaining thoughts which you um, uh, wouldn't previously have wished to entertain. There can also be preparatory meetings, which are, uh, could be uh, standing committees in effect. But there are also s specific meetings, clearness meetings, threshing meetings and sharing meetings, which are designed to try and open up uh, debate, open up com uh, conflicts and explore conflicts um, uh, ahead of time. Okay. Uh, and there's particular ways that these work. But all of these meetings, the standing committees and these other meetings, are supposedly meant to run in a quakely fashion using the business method. So the business method gets passed down to um, uh, lower level meetings. 
Another important aspect here is uh, corporate values, okay, discerning corporate values. Um, uh, so these are not supposed to be anodyne, and uh, uh, they are, have gone through a long process, uh, through many generations perhaps of Quakers, in order to settle uh, on uh, ideas such as uh, peace, truth, equality, simplicity, or sustainability. And uh, these are advertised uh, prominently in many uh, meeting houses. So this is in Brighton Meeting House, and this is in uh, Philadelphia Central Meeting. If you don't know what to decide, go back to the testimonies and ask, what would uh, simplicity ask of us? What would peace require of us? Of course, you say perhaps that, well, many corporate organizations have uh, their list of goals or list of values, but how seriously do you actually uh, uh, take them into decision-making meetings and use them? And I've seen this used really well in some Quaker meetings where a decision is going to be made, but somebody says, yes, but what about simplicity? And everybody then suddenly realizes, oh, yes, this is really complicated, unnecessarily complicated. And then within 30 seconds, uh, somebody else makes another suggestion and it's then clear to everybody blinding the obvious to everybody that that's the way that it should, should be done because this little bit of new knowledge has been brought in. I shall rest my voice for a few minutes and uh, um, invite people uh, to talk to each other.